Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. It's good to be in the booth today with you. Thanks for tuning in, no matter if you're on YouTube, hello, hello, or if you're on the podcast forum, wherever you find your podcast. Thanks for checking us and listening in. If you're on YouTube, give us a thumbs up that you watch the video, comment down below. We love to answer some of those questions. If you're in podcasts, only five stars, five star reviews. That's all we will take. We we'll share it with your friends over the holiday season, family. We're in the book of Revelation today, but before we get there, you got to go to calvarybible.com. It's Christmas season around Calvary. We don't want you to miss out on all the great things that are happening at Calvary. So go to calvarybible.com, click your campus where you're in the neck of the woods and events also submit a prayer request there are some major prayer requests always through the christmas season well in my household hope yours as well and uh we would love to be praying for for you and today we have thomas milburn back in the booth he's been a solid guest all fall long here but before we get there to revelation i got a really important question to ask how come you can't get someone better on the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> if Thomas Milburn is commissioned by his mama Milburn mm -hmm. to make something for Christmas, a treat, a dessert, what are you going to? What are you going to make for the family? That's a good question. The, the other weekend we had our Christmas gathering with Chris inside of the family. Yeah. They were in town. It was a great dinner. Yeah. Very, very good. And I told Kristen, hey, I actually just want to take the day off and cook. And that's what I got to do. Sweet. So that was fun. But what what would you make? What was you, what's your go to dessert for Christmas season? Um that you're gonna make. Not that you're gonna receive. Man, I, I don't know. Probably like a shortbread. Ooh, you're a shortbread. Yeah. That, that is so surprising. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't like butter? Yeah, totally. Like I took a stick of butter and I shoved it in this pound of <laughs> sugar. <laughs> Made some shortbread. And then I baked it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what would be yours? Which like, oh, you know what you could, you could get me? I wouldn't make them. My aunt does. Yeah. They're like the Christmas wreaths. Oh, yeah. We've talked about this before, I think. They're like... um. What do you call it? marshmallow uh, treats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're in the form of a wreath with with uh, cornflakes and the red cinnamon dots. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Those are the labors of love. That's the labor of love. I don't know. I don't yeah. even know how you make it. That's really fun. That's really fun. You, you know. You know what? Uh, last actually yesterday, Kristen was making some cookies for the Christmas pageant. <laughs> Yum. You know, one of the things that most people don't know about the Christmas pageant is in between the shows, yeah. there is a cookie feast. <laughs> 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 and she made some that had peppermint, mm -hmm. and they're like become like dark chocolate and peppermint cookies. They're becoming my favorite. Nice. Yeah. I can pound a few of those. The, the cookie, or whatever it is, yeah. the the uh, the whatever they put out there at the play is phenomenal. It is phenomenal. <laughs> it rivals wedding receptions. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's so much fun. If you like Christmas cookies, which I grew up where you go to grandma's house and there's tins of cookies that she yep. has baked yep. for a couple of days in anticipation of our arrival yeah. <laughs> at Christmas. And that's like the Christmas play pageant because they're all homemade, all, all, these, mm -hmm. all these cookies, and it's just a feast. We, every year, my wife throws, I don't know if it's our 12th annual, 14th annual, I don't know, um, cookie exchange in our neighborhood. Oh, yeah. So we tell our neighbors, bring your favorite Christmas cookie mm -hmm. and enough to share with other people. And then at the end of the evening, we all exchange cookies. So you get like, you know, half a dozen of 20 people's right. cookies. And it's really nice. That is awesome. That's like my go-to, besides puppy chow. That's a family puppy chow. tradition now as well, puppy chow. And we, if it's cold on Christmas, sometimes it's not. Yeah. Sometimes we're in Texas and it's not cold. But we make wassail. What is that? Wassail is a giant hodgepodge of different 
uh, liquids. So like orange juice and cinnamon and um, apple juice. And I think there's some, um, yeah, there's just apple cider as well. So and you basically empty the refrigerator into of all, a jug. Yeah, till, and you put it on the stove and you cook it and you warm oh, okay. it up. Yeah. And it unlocks all these flavors and they mix and you just drink wassail. <laughs> do you pour Dr. Pepper in that? No, you do not. <laughs> Dr. Pepper does not go in wassail. <laughs> but uh, it's a it's a bunch of different. It's sort of funny to like go to the store and buy all these ingredients because they're all in these you know, you just never drink some of this juice and then you all put it together. And okay, so has up. someone created a wassail recipe? Yeah, yeah or definitely. like a can of wassail. Like, can you go to the store and just buy wassail now? I think you can. I imagine. But there's there's a famous Christmas song with wassail in it. So That's anyways. not in my in my uh, head. What is that? Well, it's now that you say it, I'm going to lose it <laughs> in my head. <laughs> Yo, Caroling, it's, um, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm gonna look at this. Go up. caroling, drinking the wassail. Yeah, it's okay. so here. Here's Wikipedia. Okay, of it's all the it's standard a, of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's sort of like a old Norris beverage, mulled cider ale or wine with spices. Ours does not have alcohol in it because we have kids that drink it, but it is um. It's an old, old Christmas tradition. Okay. Okay. There's actually a Christmas carol called Wassel Wassel All Over the Town, where toast it is white and our L it is brown. Our bowl is made of white maple tree with the wassail bowl we drink unto thee. There's even an old Christmas carol there. Let's nice. find it. There's another Christmas carol. It's... um. You're gonna have to keep talking. We're losing Mark, people. Mark knows it. Mark, what is the what is the Christmas Carol? Here we come a wassailing. Yep. Here we come a wassailing, tossling down the way. Yep. It was oh, mentioned also in shows by Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra in 1957 <sighs> on the Happy Holidays from Bing and Frank. Anyways, the pinnacle of Christmas culture. Bing Crosby, yeah, probably. probably. Oh, he is the pinnacle. There it is. Okay, what's your favorite Christmas movie? What's the go-to every year? I think at some point it's either a Christmas story okay. or I Chevy hate, Chases. Yeah, I hate, I <laughs> hate the Christmas, Christmas story. I hate the Christmas story. Why? Why are you a I, hater? I don't know. I just, I do not like that movie whatsoever. Mm. Um, sorry. I'm sorry for you. Mine's White Christmas. It gets a little long. <laughs> <laughs> but... Back to Ben Crosby, right there, man. Oh my gosh. Yep. Yeah, the, yeah. You, okay. I mean, Elf has to be what up there. Uh, yeah, I think it's every fun. year. Yeah, it's good. It's good. every year. I would just watch. say there's something about probably National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't watch one. any other National Lampoon's anything. Yeah, yeah. But the Christmas Vacation it's is little. hysterical. <laughs> Home Alone's probably up there for my kids. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Um, right. Yeah. All right, let's jump into the text. <laughs> <'Cause we've> just, <laughs> our, now that we've uh, lost about half the viewership. Yeah, bored you to death. Let's get in it. Not knowing where wassailing comes from. Thanks, Mark. We have Mark. He he actually sits in these podcasts now and records Yep. for YouTube, which if you haven't been to our YouTube channel, you can see Thomas's face on YouTube once again midweek. Man. <laughs> the digital life, but Thomas Milberg has life. no clue. I have no um, idea where I live online. Yeah, totally. It's fascinating <laughs> to me. One day I'm going to meet my digital version. Yeah. I'm, I'll probably be really sad. You'll probably like hate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, is that what I look like on the camera? Yeah, totally. How many cameras are on me? Okay, so we're in Revelation, if you didn't know. Nearing the end. Nearing the end. Nearing the end. <laughs> And it's a perfect, it's actually, the book of Revelation is perfect for the Christmas season because we're yeah. talking about the first arrival and the second arrival of Jesus Christ. I said that on Sunday. You need to go to calvarybible.com slash advent. Get plugged in on some of the practices we're doing around here yeah. in Christmas season to prepare our hearts for the second coming of Jesus. The second advent. Yes. Yeah. So we're in revelation 19 yeah which you sort of picked up in verse 6 this week because the week before in 18 
you carried over into 19. It's just a great reminder to those who are unfamiliar and those who are familiar that the numbers and chapters in the Bible yeah. aren't spirit inspired. One of one of the most disappointing chapter breaks is definitely next week's after 19 and 20. That chapter break has caused a lot of problems because people think there's a break. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but some monks long ago got together and broke up the Bible. Which I'm thankful for because you can actually find some verses, man. Right. And it's, it's helpful to navigate. Yeah. Sometimes there's, though, places you wish. It just it continued. Would, yeah, continued. So, yeah, we, we continued right into 19. But in verse, in, well, in chapter 19, though, we're continuing in the loud voice of great multitude singing hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. Yeah. I think when we talk about set up chapter 18 and 19, we need to talk about who's the only one who is true and just to actually bring about judgment. Yeah. And that would be a God and God alone. Which is we talked about, you know, our first theme of Advent is hope. Mm-hmm. And here we our ultimate hope is in Jesus Christ. Yeah. In what he has accomplished. And our ultimate hope is in the blessed appearing of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm at his second advent, which is what we see in, in 19 highlighted. Now, where, what I think is interesting, I always talk about the clippings that don't make it, uh, what you just read there about the loud, mm-hmm. um, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. There's a guy, Randy, I was talking to a few Sundays ago. And I said, how's the series going? He said, it's great. I'm just reading Revelation you know, each day. and I'm, I've been in it a lot. And one of the things that has been so striking to me is how loud the book is. Mm. And, I th- and I thought, that's true. It's so true. I, d- I actually never thought about that, how yeah. it, it is loud from the beginning to the end. Mm-hmm. And so you have here in 19, you know, what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude. Then you have um, verse 6, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of many peals of thunder. And you, even in the very beginning, Revelation 1, like John's, vision begins with loud noises. And it's like, man, Revelation is a very loud book. Yeah. That's a good observation. It is a very good observation. That's those observations only happen because you're reading it. Yeah. Over and over again. Here's here's a good Bible trivia for our listeners. Yes. When you think of the word hallelujah, we sing this probably at Christmas. We sing this in our worship songs. Hallelujah means praise God. How many times do you think the word hallelujah is used in the New Testament? Mm, that's a really good Bible trivia. I would say off the top of my head, over 100 times? Over 100 times? I was thinking like 30. Okay. Uh, the answer is four, and all four of them are right here. No way. Yeah. Outside of the gospel <laughs> of Hosanna? Yeah. Hallelujah is right here. That's it. That's it. Really? Yeah. That's what the, Bible tri- <laughs> what the trivia experts say. Our listeners can well, fact check true that. Yeah. But no, this is this is the this is the Hallelujah Chorus. Wow. So if you actually know the Hallelujah Chorus, it's from Revelation. And this is it right here. So four hallelujahs. I was way off. I was way off. Yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know why I didn't realize that. Yeah. But this is it right here in these like seven verses, four times, hallelujah. Uh, salvation and glory belong to God. Hallelujah. The smoke of destruction. It's like evil is over. Hallelujah. From the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all his servants. Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. That's it. And wow. so, again, it just That's reminds amazing. us, like the whole book of Revelation is intended in one way to just bring about worship, mm. is to continue to help us see the reality of God's work in the past, in the present, and in the future, and for all the saints in the midst of suffering and hardship to know that he will vindicate us and when we are vindicated, we will worship him, and we will join the multitude singing, hallelujah, hallelujah. Mm. That's amazing. Isn't that cool? That is amazing. So cool. So here's a word that I want to talk about that just keeps my attention is in verse 7, the bride has made herself ready. This imagery of a marriage can be very unique, from especially a man's perspective. Mm-hmm. Right, from a woman's perspective, I bet it's actually helpful more than. But from a man's perspective, we we aren't brides, we're grooms. Yeah, but the biblical metaphor is always we're brides. Yeah, 
for the for the New Testament church. Yeah. We are brides. We are, we are wedded. Um, yeah, I think what I would say to every guy that struggles with it is get over it. <laughs> <laughs> That's very helpful. <laughs> like, stop it. Um, because the Bible is filled with lots of metaphors that you could struggle with. Like, man, I really struggle with God being father. Right. If you have an abusive dad, it's like, it's really hard to reconcile those two, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, you might say in revelation 19, that you see Jesus as the conquering warrior, um, who comes in victory to destroy. It's like, I just can't, I just have a hard time picturing Jesus in destroying evil. Mm -hmm. Um, we even joke, you know, he has, has a tattoo, Right. It's like, I have a hard time struggling with that. It's like, no, well, that's the point. Is he's revealing who he is. Mm-hmm. And the bridal imagery is just intimacy. Mm-hmm. That is such a beautiful picture of this warrior king's desire to have an intimate relationship with his church. Do you, uh, this is striking too, and I didn't prep you for this, so you might not know. And that's okay, because sometimes on the podcast we don't do know. We, do we prep for this? Well, <laughs> the word bride is actually capitalized here. And and the ESV, yeah. I wonder, is it always capitalized? Mm, that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it's it's probably because it's a proper proper, proper name. Yeah, proper right? name. The bride. The bride. Yeah, which goes back to you know Jesus talked about in his coming to be ready like a wedding party, mm-hmm. waiting for the groom to show up. Totally. So keep our wicks trimmed and ready. Yeah, let's go to Matthew twenty five. Yeah. So this is picked up language from the Old Testament in Isaiah 25 as well. But here we are in Matthew 25. Jesus says, verse 1, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And, And as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept but at midnight there was a cry here is the bridegroom come out to meet him then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said to the wise give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out but the wise answered saying since there will not be enough for us and for you go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves and while they were going to buy the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut And so the whole teaching is you need to be ready for the bridegroom. And I think this is the revelation story is, okay, you're going to have persecution. There's going to be hardships. So I'm I'm revealing this to you for endurance Mm -hmm. to trim your lamps, to keep, keep them filled because there's a delay in his coming. And I think we've experienced that delay. We feel that delay, but there's also an end to that delay Mm -hmm. and there's an end of opportunity. Yeah. And so be ready. So you, you quoted Romans eight, which I thought, you know, you picked it up in 24. I think 22 is sort of where I started in it. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of the Son, Son, sorry, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are, were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Mm -hmm. I thought that was like, what a great sort of summation of our response to chapter 19. Yeah. I think that is the characteristic of our waiting is it's not like passive waiting. We don't just check out of life. It's hopeful waiting. We wait in hope, and it colors in our whole day is that we're hopeful. Right. Um, I think that's that's an error in some people's revelation theology is, hey, this whole thing's just going to get burned up, so why do anything? Right. Why build anything? Why participate in anything? Why invent anything? Why care about anything? It's like that's so unchristian mm-hmm. is that we're called to fully participate in the world around us but not be of it, and that was you know a week ago. But we are called to wait with great hope and eager expectation. Yeah, because we're the bride and we're waiting for the wedding. Yeah. The wedding. Yeah, yeah if you go back to Revelation, you know, um, blessed are those who invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, these are the w- true words. And yeah. it's like, okay, we are invited to a wedding supper. 
and we will be clothed in new clothes to be there. And so we are to be prepared for that, to be dressed and ready, to make ourselves ready. Right. And you just think, I mean, I, I have two daughters. They're too young to be married right now. And they'll Unless be they were married l- long ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's going to come a day. I mean, I've, I've done, I've officiated a lot of weddings. Right. Um, the amount of work that goes into a bride getting ready for wedding day can be monumental. Right. It's not the same for everybody. I get that. But the preparation for the day. Mm-hmm. And I would just say, do we spend half the energy getting ourselves ready for the Lord? Right. Yeah. That's a really good question. Do we spend, do we spend half the resources mm-hmm. invested in the spiritual care of ourselves or others being ready for the Lord? Or if we were to add up all the dollars and time we spent just getting ready for our wedding day or helping our friends get ready for their wedding day, would it just be like, would it just eclipse the amount of energy and time we spend getting ready for the Lord? That's really interesting. I think one of the helpful things about the whole imagery is do yourself a favor and go study sort of the wedding, how a wedding was put on in the first century. It's super yeah. fascinating. It's a whole monumental days of events yeah. that lead to the culmination of the celebration. And I think that's sort of a great metaphor for the even the end times is it's not just a one time thing. It's the it's the turning of the dial yeah. towards something that's coming. Yeah. That I think it's been very striking a revelation for me. Yeah, specifically the Galilean wedding ceremony. Mm-hmm. If if you understand kind of the sequential events of that, you can embed Jesus' anticipation of his return. Because he he embeds that in the wedding preparations. Mm-hmm. So I go to prepare a place for you. I mean, that's that's very Jewish of, okay, we, we are in a betrothal period. Now I go to prepare a place for my bride and my future family. We see that in the Christmas story yeah. with Joseph and Mary. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. So, yeah, that, that is a, that's a good thing to have in your mind when you're thinking about the return of Christ. Yeah. That's beautiful. So, in, in chapter 19, we get one of the greatest word pictures of Jesus. Yeah. White I think horse. So. Rider on the white horse. Um, we we've heard some really cheesy Christmas Christian songs about the wider the rider of the white horse over the years, but it's a beautiful, beautiful image of what is coming. There's twelve things that you pointed out about the white horse. Um what actually not the white horse, but what's happening in this moment. Mm-hmm. What's striking to you about sort of chapter nineteen eleven through the end of the chapter? with the white horse and all that's taking place. Well, I think the emphasis is that Jesus is on the white horse. Mm -hmm. So it's a picture of Jesus that we often don't talk about. Yeah. And, you know, I said it on Sunday. There's there's often a picture of Jesus that's given that is emasculated of Jesus um, in such a way that I think oftentimes men have a hard time worshiping Jesus because... They have so domesticated or made him effeminate that this this adds to the mercy compassion pictures of Jesus mm-hmm. in such a way that you go, oh my goodness, that is a that is a masculine, mighty warrior that is coming to set the world right, and that yeah. just needs to be added to the imagery that we have from other places. Right, and so you know, I make fun of boyfriend. Jesus is my boyfriend. You know, music or we're kissing Jesus, and, you know, it's just weird. This is weird music, man. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. And so, a mighty fortress is my God. Right. Um, my Redeemer lives. It's like, yeah, this is that picture. Mm-hmm. And so, you have this picture of Jesus really overlaid in probably a very Roman picture that everyone would have been familiar with, which is the conquering general is parading back into Rome up to the temple, the captives, and everyone is seeing their victory. Yeah. Everyone is impressed by their victory. Everyone is, you know, is humbled by the fact that they belong to the empire. Now, this is in its pure sense because he's faithful and just. He brings justice that's equitable. Like, this isn't a, a perversion of that. Right. This is what we all long for which is the world to be set right for evil to be destroyed. And so you have the conquering general coming in with 
you know, so much imagery. Right. We got uh, the faithful and true, the judges, war and righteousness, eyes are aflame with fire, wearing many crowns, has an unna- unknown name, which I thought was super fascinating. Yeah. I thought that was really fascinating. I was like, As a name that no one knows, no one which I think is, that's what God would say of himself. Yeah. Totally. Like, give me your name. And most is asking. I am. I am am who I am. Like, you don't have to know my name. In fact, don't don't use my name in vain. Yeah. Super interesting. So there's a depth to Jesus that is more than just how we put him in the manger this season. Mm -hmm. And say, that's Jesus. Right. Clothed in blood. His his robe is dripped with blood. Which you talked about how that was more actually the work of the cross than anything else. It could be. That's one interpretation of it. So it's a link back to Isaiah... It's either 49 or 63, I have to remember. I mean, it feels like a link all the way back to Genesis where Judah is dripped in wine. Yeah, it's a picture of here Here comes someone from the battlefield yeah. who's victorious, yeah. and their their clothing is blood spattered. Hmm. But the, the, uh, the interpretation that we mentioned on Sunday is he shows up with a, a blood-soaked robe or a dipped robe before the battle begins. So whose blood's on his robe and... People will say oh, it's his. He comes by way of the cross. By his first coming, he, he lets enemies put him to death. And so he comes with the markers of his own first death. Wow. That's beautiful. So what about the word of God? Is maybe number eight, number nine is the armies of heaven arrayed with fine linens, white and pure, following him on the white horse. Mm-hmm. It, he has an army. Comes with a company. Yeah. Which he talks about, it alludes to even when the betrayal of Jude, Judas, and the, he said if, Peter, put away your sword. If I wanted to, I could just call down yeah. legions. Yeah. <laughs> they, we'd just be done, right? Yep. It continues to solidify that this dude has absolute authority. He's he, Everything is in control. Okay, sword from his mouth, a rod of iron in his hand. What's a rod of iron? What would we... Uh, why is that important? I think that's a my picture of Americanism doesn't catch up. Yeah, it goes back to Psalm 2. We didn't talk about this on Sunday. Oh, which... By the way, in 2023, Psalm 2 has come to life. Yeah. In my life. Yeah. That's where we're going, man. I, and when, yeah. Anyways. Uh, Psalm 2 is, you know, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So that's a picture of what we see in Revelation is all the nations gathering. This is Babylon. All the kings of the earth gathering in opposition towards God, coming together to say, let's throw off God. And it's like, you do this in vain. And he's going to come, as we've seen in the Psalms, as the good shepherd. But instead of having just a staff of wood, you have verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like potter's vessels. Yeah. And here's the warning. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with tremble. Kiss the son. That's yeah. That's the most Receive important. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Kiss the son. At least he be angry and you will perish in the way. Yeah. So it's he comes to execute this. Yeah. But it's interesting. He comes to execute this in chapter 19 before he sets up or before 20 is set up for mm-hmm. us in this millennial kingdom. So that's yeah. what he's coming to do is put an end to all the nations that have gathered against him in vain. Yeah, because in verse 17 through 19, the beasts gather to make war and the false prophets, and it doesn't go well for them no, very quickly. You actually see, I don't know how this works um, linguistically. Someone who's smarter than me could do this. But there's it's almost a chiastic structure in the revealing of God's adversaries and then the judging of his adversaries. Mm. So we saw back in 12, this first character which is the dragon, Satan himself. Then he stands on the shore and animates beast one from the sea, and then it's prophet beast two uh, from the land. And then we see Babylon, the harlot, come. Um, And then you see all of them waging war against the saints. And then what you see here from 18, 19, and 20 is the reversal of that same order, but now it's in judgment. And so first the harlot is judged and destroyed, then beast one and two, and then Satan himself in 20. Wow, that's super interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. It's something you miss if you didn't have a slowing down of the text, right? So, like here, here they the judgment of Jesus. I mean, we we missed a few others. I just want to go back. 
um, he treads on the wine press, and he's the king of kings and lord of lords, which is where we get that title of him. Yeah, which is one of the best titles I think of Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. I I, I mean, especially yeah. Christmas, but more importantly, like that's that's an amazing title. Yeah, I just think of like the boxers when they come into the arena, they have like their entourage with them. Yeah, and they're wearing their yeah their kids their, their robe. Yeah, you know, and the hoods over, and on the back, it, it's probably like you know their their name. Yeah, it whatever it is, like the the nickname that they've been given. You know. But he has this robe, and it's like, King of Kings, Lord, Lord of, of Lords. Lords. And you're like, I don't want to go in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to end well. <laughs> or it's going to end really well, depending awesome. on who you, yeah. whose team you're on. It's awesome. So here's the thing. They get the, all these things get thrown in the lake of fire. Yeah. And it says they were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on his horse. Yeah. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. I mean, like, that is gross. You don't read that in the morning in your <laughs> devotionals? That's yeah. A, that's, a, that's an incredible sort of scene that we need to pay attention to, probably. Yeah, it's a what judgment scene. Um, that's not unlike other judgments in the Old Testament. Right. So you have Sodom and Gomorrah, which is, a you know, the, it's going to burn with sulfur, fire from heaven. Um, that's consume good. That's evil. a good hyperlink. Yeah. Right, so that it's going to be total. Uh, you're, you're going to see the birds of the air feast on the flesh of kings. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's to the people who are rich and wealthy and the people who are in poverty. It, it's indiscriminate as far as social status here. It's, it's interesting we have an eternal feast for those on the right yeah. sides in the king of kings, lord of lords corner. And on the other ones, the birds eat the flesh. The birds, which is... Again, Old Testament language of total destruction of an enemy, that the birds of the air and the, the wild animals mm-hmm. in the field would feed on their flesh. Yeah. It's what Goliath tries to threaten David with. Totally. Because I'm going to kill you, and then the birds will devour your flesh. Very visceral yeah. experience where if, you're, if you have to be the person to clean up a battle, this is what you see days and weeks oh my afterwards. Gosh. Can you just, I mean, uh, we're so far field. removed from this sort of imagery. Right. Living in the safety of suburbia America. Right. This would be, I mean, this is in, in parts of our world, a drastic reality mm-hmm. that it's not as grotesque for them as far as like, yeah, we, we long for Jesus to come and remove all of this. We've seen the consequences of yeah, this. We've seen the bodies on the battlefield and That's the birds right. eating their flesh. And in, in some ways, um, you, this is the only thing that restrains you from taking vengeance on your, on your enemies. Mm-hmm. Is when Jesus says, or when God says, um, in Romans eight, like leave, leave room for wrath, for vengeance is mine. Mm-hmm. Like don't repay evil for evil. The only way that you can restrain yourself from doing that is to know that the true judge is coming mm-hmm. to bring vengeance. That's the right and fitting response. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you just have to take it in your hands. Right. And so this, this, these sorts of texts, though they're vivid and they're graphic, it's actually what keeps the Christian from taking these measures in their own hands. Mm-hmm. They say, no, that's for God. God will deal with that when the time is right. Mm-hmm. For me, I'm called to love my enemy, to bless my enemy, to pray for my enemy, and the Lord will take care of my enemies. Mm-hmm. So, Because yeah. he's the one tru- just and true back to the beginning. Of he's the only life. one trustworthy to do it, yeah. right? Yeah, everyone else has an agenda yeah. that is warped, and his is not. Yeah. Yeah. It's Super good. True. So after 19... What what are some of the things you've thought about, you know, leaving the text this last week? What are some things that you're like, man, I, this was hard or, you know, what, is, what did you, yeah, what's sort of your response? I think for me, the biggest thing from 19 is, okay, this is the picture of the glorious return of Jesus, our blessed hope. This is our ultimate hope is that he comes and that we join him at the feast. And it gives us a picture of who Jesus is that perhaps we don't meditate on enough. Right, And with that amazing picture in strength and might and vengeance um, is a picture of the one in whom I'm wedded to. Which again goes back to your question of like, man, as dudes, we have a hard time thinking of ourselves as the bride. You're like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, But this is the God who doesn't want to just make you a subject and have you eternally serve him in in suffering and pain for all of eternity. This is 
a God who says, man, the relationship I have with my people for all of eternity is that like that of a wedding banquet. Yep. It's a relationship. It's a he relationship. wants a relationship. In intimacy. I mean, you think like, yeah. we have a good relationship, but think about the relationship you have with your spouse. That's so exposing. Mm-hmm. Like she knows all the things of your thoughts. Like you're sharing with her what's on your mind. That's what's in God's mind and heart when he thinks about wedding us. Mm-hmm. Like in some crazy way, it's like, I'm fully exposed only in my marriage, like physically, emotionally, in a healthy marriage. And just like, that's, that's the relationship I want. Yeah. That's to it. have that sort of depth forever. Yeah. And I think the point of, and we're going to get to this, the point of all this is that you and I, we, people of Calvary, people who want to be part of the Supper of the Lamb, ex- we get Jesus. Yeah. We, we get his presence. That's all, that's what we were designed for was that. Yeah. Which is sort of hard to, it makes you reframe your day to ask the question, what was, what am I going to and what am I designed for? And that is it. Yeah. It makes you say, okay, then that's where I need to invest my time. I know. I think so many people, and Christians included, specifically world religions in general, have such a poor view of eternal life, mm-hmm. of like all the stuff I'm going to get or the planets that I'm going to get. Or things I'm going to get to do that are finally, you know, on my time. It's like, Jesus told us, John 17, like this is eternal life, to know the Father and the one whom he sent. To yeah. know him. Well, how are we going to know him? You're going to know him like a, like a bride and a groom. Yeah. That's how you're going to know him. That's eternal life. Totally. And that begins now and gets better. Yeah, and, and it's why we live for today, right? Like, you want to, what's, what's the highest thing on your priority today? Get this podcast done. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is, it's a relationship with Christ. Yeah. Right? That's the highest reality. So. But everyone, like, blessed are the ones who are invited to the marriage supper. Right. Like, that's the wedding invitation. Mm-hmm. Is the invitation has gone out. And the world's invited. Whosoever believes in me, I'll never turn away. It's like Luke 14, I believe. It's like, there's a master who wants to throw a wedding banquet. People make excuses not to show up, yeah. and he's like, "Go to the streets, yeah, then go to the alleyways." Who wants my, it? I, I love it, God. My house must be filled. My house must be filled. Yeah. Like he, he's not interested in a poultry wedding banquet. No, it's like okay, so if you're not exclusive. interested. I'll go find someone who is right. And I think that's that's even a better picture of heaven when people say, you know, what's heaven like? It's like, well, it's everyone who wants to be with Jesus, and everybody who doesn't want to be in G- with Jesus. Gets what they want too. Yeah. Amazing. So, how do we frame this up for Christmas, Advent? Oh, I think you just go back to okay the historical reality that's documented, that's witnessed, that's cataloged of His first coming, gives me the certainty that everything that He said that He will do mm-hmm. will come. Yeah. Amazing. Great. All right, Calvary. We're so thankful you're listening in. Don't forget to hit up calvarybible.com slash advent this season. Advent is just a simple practice, right? There's scriptures each day to center yourself on the reality that the bride is coming and that you're invited to the wedding. And don't forget that that your friends are invited to that wedding as well. And this season, we have so many opportunities for you to invite your friends, not into just coming to church, but a relationship with Jesus Christ. And sometimes, most of the time, that starts by you inviting them to church. Right? Yeah. Come sit with me. I'll save a seat. All right. We're praying for you. We hope that you're having a great week. And more importantly, more importantly, we hope that you have a week filled, centered upon Christ, especially during the Christmas season. Love you. Talk to you soon.